Welcome to the Back Porch. My name is Ricky Alexander. And I'm Sweet Meg. We're here with one of my favorite pianists, Jesse Gelber. Jesse asked a great question earlier today. What did he say? Oh, yeah. Jesse asked, what are we doing? And um, so the point of this is that we have such a wonderful community here in New York. You know, from a distance, all you see is like the front men and a bunch of side men. But there's this family going on and underneath it all. And so with this show, we wanted to bring out all the characters that are behind the scenes and in front of the scenes. And so Jesse Gelber's with us today. He's one of those kind of wonderful characters. I've always loved being on gigs with Jesse because he tells the best stories <laughs> and it's just hilarious to be around and really fun. Um, and so that's our guest today is Mr. Jesse Gelber. Well, let's go back now to the past a bit more. You're from Boston, Massachusetts originally? I'm originally from California. Oh, you're from California. I always thought you were from I, like up there because you spent so much time there. Right. So I, I grew up in California. My parents are from the East Coast. My mom's from uh, near Philadelphia. My father was born in the Bronx. But then I went to school in Boston and I was there for like six years. And then I came to New York and I've been here for a million years. So. Do you have any wacky stories from Boston? Well, my first regular gig in Boston was at a place called Doc's Cafe. And we played in a place which um, had been a rap club and somebody got murdered in the club. So they decided to turn it into a Latin dance club and somebody else got murdered in the club. So they decided to play it safe and turn it into a jazz club. <laughs> and Is that the safe route? Okay. That was the safe route. And somehow yours truly, just a college kid at the time, got the gig playing at Doc's Cafe in this, in this, uh, in this club. And, and their plan to tone things down with the jazz worked. It, it, it kept people from coming into the club playing jazz, as you guys know how that goes. So yeah, so the only people who actually ended up coming into the club were the street walkers that would go up and down uh, North Chandler Street. That was the street. It was a kind of an infamous street. And they would come in with their pimps just to kind of take a load off uh, from doing what they were doing. And they would sit and listen to the jazz music. And, you know, I got to say, actually, the pimps and hookers were uh, an appreciative audience. They, they enjoyed the music. And uh, we even played a uh, birthday party there for a transsexual hooker named Connie. So that, that happened, yeah. the story folks of Willie the Weaver made his occupation as a chimney sweeper. He had a dope habit, he had it kind of bad. Uh, listen, let me tell you about the dream he had. Dream he bought a hound from a man who lived in Turkey. Told a woman dancing, please make it herky jerky. She wore out the carpets, she wore out the floor. Said, dance it again, you'll never dance it no more. At the North Pole, someone chatted Willie. He turned around and saw a sight that knocked him really silly. Standing before him in the zero breeze was a chimpanzee in his BBDs. He walked around and around till his feet started freezing. Somebody said, cutie, better listen to reason. I want my coffee, want it good and strong. I want my biscuits all 18 inches long. Now tell me, what would you do if your dreams could come true? Well, something tells me you'd lock your door like Willie the Weaver. Together, you got nothing on me. Now tell me, what would you do if your dreams could come true? Well, something tells me you'd lock your door.
something tells me you lock your door like Willie the Weeper and cry for please go away and let me sleep don't disturb my slumber deep well something tells me When did you get down to New York? Uh, in the late 90s. Late 90s? Yeah. So were you straight to Manhattan or you in Brooklyn or? So I, I moved to Williamsburg and Williamsburg was not the cool neighborhood. There were three chop shops operating in the neighborhood. Uh, I mean, not that I'm an expert on crime other than the fact that I did play for some, you know, ne'er-do-wells <laughs> up in Boston. But uh, you didn't have to be an expert in, in chop shops to know that it was what was going on because there were lines of cars without license plates or with out-of-state license plates. And when they were done with the cars, they would bring the cars over. There was an overpass near the post office there, and they would, they would just light the cars on fire just to get rid of the evidence. So there was, you know, once, every now and then you just drive by and there'd be this booming thing of fire <laughs> shooting out of a car. There was no street cleaning at that time. Uh, so you could just leave your car on the street, which was kind of nice. There was actually a club, this is funny. There was a club not far from where I lived called Cokie's. It was an after hours bar where you could get your, well, Cokie's. And, um, and, there, and uh, I actually, played in there like at least once uh, they had music yeah and there was a tent and you went past the tent to you know and um <laughs> and uh yeah cokies and yeah so they, they they they, they kind of quietly also <laughs> left at a certain point yeah sure yeah yeah there's not much of that like i don't know there's not much of that old new york i mean maybe there's somewhere but it's that kind of rough and tumble i don't know scrappy New York. Well, it's, that's it's the thing. It's like today I play at all these bars where people pretend to yeah. break the law. They pretend <laughs> to be yeah. gangsters. They pretend. But I, I was, as I said, just old enough that I caught the tail end of the actual, you know, when, um, well, you had to mind your P's and Q's. Let's just yeah. put it that way. Um, I remember playing one place out on Long Island. Um, I'm pretty certain, as a result, my picture is probably in an FBI file because of it, walking into this place. Uh, but it was just a pool party, and um, I was playing with a doo-wop band. I was backing them up, which, by the way, you only know, need to know four chords to play <laughs> in a doo-wop band, because I didn't know any of the songs, but it did not matter. Um, right. And uh, during one of the set breaks, I went and sat down uh, on a chair, and one of the guys in the band came over to me and was like, Jesse, Jesse, man, you got to get out of that chair, man. That's like, that's somebody's chair. You're going to get us killed. You've got to get us out of that. Yeah, it was that kind of scene, yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Yeah, there's not much left of that. No. Yeah, it's like in some ways it's like, you know, it's great that it's safe here. But, yeah, another, no, you know, uh, but in other ways you're like, well, well I will we'll keep it time. Know. Crime's on the rise, so <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll see. There. We'll see if we can. But yeah, another way I'm, I'm on for that. We'll, we'll get. We'll get. We'll, we'll, we'll get back there. So. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, hopefully there'll be more crime in New York, so we can, <laughs> so we can get more gigs. <laughs> yeah. You know, more uh, weird gigs. I was, you know, you know you, uh, it's a wonderful life. You know, the movie and the, and and when when everything goes goes wrong in the dr in his sort of you know uh, dream. Uh, after he's sort of dead or whatever, and he goes to Pottersville, they call it Pottersville. He goes in there, and uh, and like the whole thing is like you know been taken over by graft, and and it's horrible. And yet in every in every bar, there's like a an amazing jazz band playing. And I was always like, well, man, I want to go to Pottersville. Like that's <laughs> awesome. Like so, I mean, you know, obviously my priorities have been maybe not not totally in line with the rest of society. Mm -hmm.